Hey guys, it's Tom Box. Thanks for tuning in to MST.TV and in this video we're gonna learn how to crush the Orcus deck. Oh my god, these Orcus, they're everywhere and I'm actually having a really bad time against them. To be honest, if I get to play against another Orcus deck, you might as just, well, open up the Shadow Realm door, throw my deck in there and I'll just chase him to follow. Yeah, that's how bad my matchups are right now. I've won four games out of 15 and out of those 15, there were matches, they were sided. And I still lost. Why did I lose? Well, I'm somehow cursed against this deck where even with the Artifact Lancia, even with the Phantasme, I can't seem to win at all. So luckily Georgie was there to uh, help me compile this list. He's having a great time against Orcus. So I got him to help me out with this list and these Hand traps, floodgates, and techs so we can crush this deck. We'll also look up their opening play so that we can understand what kind of disruption they have so you guys can get a better understanding of the interactions that you will have to deal with. Okay guys, because if I can't beat Orcus, I might as well just get you guys to beat him so I don't have to fight against it. Sound good? Alright, let's get into this. In terms of strengths, okay, they have a really strong opening play that sets up multiple boar removals and negation that can bypass chain blocks because they negate the effect on the resolution so they don't really care and that's all thanks to their ability to search fog blades with uh, Phantom Knight Rusty Bardiche. With Rusty Bardiche, they get the immediate set of fog blade from the initial activation and the second fog blade will be coming from Silent Boots which is normally searched from Ancient Cloak. So with all those things in mind, they get to set up about two negations, but in terms of their monster removal, it also comes from Bardiche. It's not just monster removal, it's two card removal. So you get the Bardiche and the Dingirsu that will be summoned out from the graveyard. So the opening play itself will contain two set fog blades, a rusty Bardiche, a Galatea to recycle material, a Babel, Symbol Skeleton, and Dingirsu in the graveyard. So that's live thanks to the field spell. So two removals and two negations at least. The additional monster that can come out with this board is if they have another level four monster, they can also go into Time Thief Redoer, and since it's going to be summoned out from the Phantom Knight Shade Brigadine, there's going to be a trap attached, which means there's also another shuffle back to the top of the deck that you'll also have to answer to. So lots of problems, and also your opponent will get to look at your top card because it's going to attach onto the Time Thief Redoer. Sure, they're not going to go into like as a thought, but this is still a lot to deal with, and if you're unsuccessful at breaking their board, you can expect to immediately die the next turn because with that many bodies on board and just the sheer number in terms of damage is already 8k with these guys, but they can also go into a Boral Sword and follow up with an OTK while recycling a lot of their materials. So yeah, there's that. But in terms of weaknesses, this, the, this deck has weaknesses, they're susceptible to hand traps, disruption during the comboing phase of the deck, they can get locked up by floodgates, and you can also hit them with really well-timed banish effects as well. So, you know, if you can hit their graveyard and disrupt the grave control, and they don't have a combo, then the board is much, much easier to answer for. Okay, looking to hand traps, we have Ash Blossom, Joyous Spring, DD Crow, Bell, Ghost Ogre, Lancia, Impermanence, No Materia, and Phantasme. I seem to not have the best understanding with these things, but thanks to Georgie, I got a much better understanding, and also thanks to Simo's recent video of the Orcus Combo Tutorial. But anyways, looking into Ash Blossom, first of all, be careful if they have Sky Striker Eagle Booster, because if they have Eagle Booster, things might not work out so well for you, okay? So that it, you're not likely going to be able to negate the Nightmare Mermaid, so you have to wait for a proper timing before you can use Ash Blossom. Okay, that being said, so if they do go into Nightmare Mermaid, when should you actually throw it out? So if the discard cost is not an Orcus Nightmare or Harp Horror, and they went out of the way to go into that Nightmare Mermaid, then yeah, go ahead and throw the Ash Blossom at the card, forehead beam it down to the ground, so you're not going to be able to get that extra body, and the turn kind of gets cut short at that point because they're not going to be able to go into any Orcus monster, and the board sucks. But that is the best case scenario. In the case that they do have an Eagle Booster because they could guard into it, and rather than doing like a one card combo with the Engage, instead they decided to go into a safe two card combo where Kagari adds the Engage back, adds, and then plays the Eagle Booster, sorry, adds the Eagle Booster with the Engage, then 
Nightmare Mermaid is not going to be a possibility. But instead, you can hit the, the Phantom Knight Rusty Bardiche instead. A lot of people have been playing it safer rather than just activating Bardiche straight up because, you know, it becomes susceptible to Ghost Ogre. And a lot of the smarter players, they have been able to just keep it protected while they do it so instead what's going to happen before rusty bardiche activates its effect to send something to the graveyard what you're going to see is that they're going to summon out the galatea and then go into a dingirzu so dingirzu can protect it and reattach the symbol skeleton and afterwards then the rusty bardiche will play but that also turns off their ability to use eagle booster to protect it so then you don't have to answer to two fog blades the upcoming turn but in the case that they do the other way around and you're just really unsure if they just you just think that your opponent just has way too much uh then at that point there is another target and that target is harp horror's effect to summon out symbol skeleton taking away the ability to summon symbol skeleton also prevents them from reviving the galatea and if you can't revive the galatea uh, that's going to be a bit painful, but you're likely just going to see that they're still going to go into uh, Dingirzu just to like reattach Harp Horror and put it back into the graveyard, or they're going to attach uh, instead uh, the uh, what's that? The Orcus Nightmare and put that into the graveyard so that they can also put the Symbol Skeleton back into the graveyard later on. There's just like a lot of things that they can still do. But overall, it's going to be a weakened board, and that's what you're aiming for. Next, we have DD Crow. Probably my favorite interaction against the deck because it's good going first or second. If you have multiple hand traps and you know what you're doing, you read your opponent where they committed really hard, uh, then, and this is before they get their field spell, you can banish the simple skeleton preemptively and. Uh, you can actually end their turn, but that's only if you know what you're doing. In fact, if you don't know what you're doing and you just want an easy go-to, then hit Symbol Skeleton's target. The first target that Symbol Skeleton is going to summon is going to be Galatea. You can go ahead and banish that, and uh, that kind of ends everything. Because the only thing that they will have on the field right now would be the Rusty Bardish. And if Bardish is there, well, that's it. You only have to deal with Fog Blades. There's no Galatea. Without the Galatea, uh, you don't have to, well, answer to the second Galatea, which would probably give them that field spell. So none of that shenanigans. And the reason why it's good for going first or second, because when you go second, the interaction with the symbol skeleton is that's going to summon out an or the Orcus Dingirzu onto an arrow of Bardish. And if they summon onto an arrow, they get to pop a card and send a card. So multiple benefits. First of all, you prevent Dingirzu's effect from adding back the symbol skeleton. So they have to get out of their way to put the symbol skeleton back into their resource pile that is accessible. Uh, second, you don't have a 26 beat stick on the field that protects the field. And you also save one of your cards from getting popped by Bardish. And that's why DD Crow and Ghost Spell, I think, is one of the best hand traps to have against this matchup. Then there is Ghost Ogre. Now, Ghost Ogre is kind of like a newbie hand trap because a lot of the good players, they will know how to play around it. And if they preemptively activate random cards, you might just lose a bunch of stuff for no reason. And it's just not very good. However, there is one thing you can do is that if they use Galatea's effect early on, yeah, just, just Ogre it. The, the turn is complete trash after that. Otherwise, yeah, it's not very good. Or if they use Bardish's effect early on, uh, but if you, you, it could be a bait. They could have a Sky Striker Eagle Booster just so that you waste one of your hand traps. So otherwise, yeah, Ogre, I just don't know what to hit exactly because once they get into Dengirzu, everything is just super protected. Next, we have the best hand trap against them. It is the turn skip hand trap. You should just shotgun this as early as possible because it's a turn skip, it's Lancia. Without the ability to banish cards, they can't have access to any of their Orcus monsters in the graveyard. And without that, the turn ends. There's nothing else they can do. And why am I telling you to shotgun it? This is just based off of personal experience where some people run a lure of darkness in their deck and they allure it into a call by the grave. So if you shotgun, if you know the matchup, you shotgun it, it's not that bad. Okay, so next we have impermanence. Just look at Ash Blossom. You, you kind of hit the exact same things. If one thing doesn't work, you can throw another hand trap at them. Maybe that will stick. Then we have Phantasme. Phantasme is a very interesting one. I thought that, you know, this is going to be a really good thing. 
there's two ways of using the Phantasmae. One way, of course, they're using Phantasmae to dig into a going second card, maybe a DD Crow, maybe something to interact with your opponent. It th That stuff is there, okay? And the scariest play is probably coming from the Simple Skeleton to the Dingirsu. That's probably the scariest one, so you probably want to get into, I don't know, a DD Crow or a Bell or some sort of spell trap removal to take out the Field Spell, because the Field Spell probably should be the first thing you take out in the matchup. So you can drop on their very first link uh, if you've got other hand traps. Now, I know that you want to be able to prevent the targeting from Fog Blades. Yeah, that seems very good. It, it sounds good on paper. But remember, summoning Dingirzu and summoning out Bardish, uh, that is going to kill your uh, Phantasme. So you can either wait for the second Galatea when you, you when you drop it, if you're just trying to dig for cards. You get to keep it alive, you get to block one Fog Blade, so it's easier to handle and you've got to uh, reach three cards in to try to find a card that you can out, so that's what I think. But Phantasme is likely going to die. You know, just keep that in mind. As for no material, you can just shotgun it with the, your Nightmare Phoenix and Cerberus. Uh, that turns off any access to extra monster zones and they're kind of stuck. So it's a turn skip if you get to that point. And you should just win the duel at that point. If you have an OTK deck, just kill them right then and there. If you draw into it with Phantasme, uh, the sad part is you can't activate it anymore. So you can either shuffle it back. Remember, some people are like, yeah, one after the other. Just remember, you have to control no cards when you activate this card. And also, another little ruling bit for no material is that that monster is only locked out for the turn. The word this turn is kind of tucked in there. I know some people kind of miss it. I'm just pointing it out there so that no one gets cheated with it. Yeah, they can still link it off the turn after. Okay, now looking into Floodgates, there can be only one Shadow Imprisoning Mirror, Skill Drain, Summon Limit, Rivalry, and Gozen. Okay, now looking into there can be only one, there is one funny timing that you can activate this. Otherwise, most of the other timings you're likely going to get outed as long as your opponent has some way to get Nightmare Phoenix onto the board. And I'm just going to expect that they're just gonna have it. If they have an additional danger monster left over in their hand, they can attempt to activate it and summon it out, and that will give them access to Nightmare Phoenix. Phoenix being a, well, a fiend-type monster, you're not gonna be able to stop them just because they have beast, unless the monster you summon out is somehow, um, what, what's this, Chupacabra. But outside of that, you're likely gonna be fine and they're gonna pop it. So the fun timing to do it to them would be when they summon out their first Galatea and then they have Orca Symbol Skeleton. Since they're both machine type monsters, one of them will be sent to the graveyard, which is likely gonna be the Symbol Skeleton. At this point, if they have nothing else to follow up with, then that's it. You got a free kill of a monster, but if they can follow up, their out would be a danger monster. If they Bigfoot it and they pop it, well, then that's la dee da, it's a bit too bad. But if they don't Bigfoot it, well, let's just say that they have to burn one additional monster with a simple skeleton to basically do anything. It does have a long-term impact. They're not going to have bar Bardish with this because, uh, Normally, the Symbol Skeleton Galatea is what goes into the Bardish, and without the Bardish, you're going to have a very easy time against your opponent because they put out the Phoenix. Phoenix is fire, so Phoenix cannot go into Bardish, and therefore, no Fog Blades. And no Fog Blades, no Bardish means they have a very minimum turn in the coming turn, so yeah, that's one fun thing you can do. But don't expect to block them out permanently with uh, There Can Be Only One. Next, Shadow Imprisoning Mirror. This is a complete shutout if you manage to land this one because Bardish doesn't work. The grave effects don't work. There's nothing that really outs this thing except for, of course, Nightmare Phoenix. If you can burn the Phoenix, that is going to be ideal. Remember, if you're going first and you set this, remember that they go into Phoenix as a part of their play to do the regular stuff. So if you can bait it out, then it's perfect. If you just bait out Phoenix, Phoenix misses and uh, it's game over. They can't use Unicorn to spin this after they waste their Phoenix. So yeah, that's a major win. And if they activate anything in their graveyard, in particular Symbol Skeleton, you can just completely shut them out. 
Uh, that's it. So they're gonna rely on Twin Twisters, side cards, uh, if they sided in Pankratops, and if they have Phoenix. Yeah, those are your outs. But outside of those outs, you are so going to win this game. I've tested this out in Medulce's. I had nothing, and they missed, and then I activated this. Yeah, they, they there was <laughs> there wasn't very much they can really do. I get that uh, the Dingirsu can still protect the board because that's not an activated effect. Outside of that, and everything's no problem. They can't send a card. They can't reattach. It's just it's just like they got locked out by a permanent abyss dweller almost. Next we have Skill Drain. Skill Drain's kind of the same idea as Shadow Imprisoning Mirror, except that all the grave effects still work. So. Yeah, if you do it as soon as possible when they're trying to set up their play, especially when they go into Mermaid, yeah, you can just you just win. <laughs> yeah, you just you basically you just win on that. Uh, yeah, but their their timing is of course if they have side cards, twin twisters, uh, Phoenix won't work of course because Phoenix would be negated. Uh, they they just try to assemble like a big beat stick board for the most part, but they need spell trap removal to take care of skill drain now. Next we have a summon limit. Yeah, just do it on the second summon. Like when they summon the first monster and the second one, usually it can come in the form of Neospace Connector. You just do it there and the uh, turn ends. Yeah, that's GG. Uh, unless they have Twin Twisters. Of course, they have Twin Twisters, they can out it and just make sure you know your time. You just do it as soon as you can. When they summon Token, Token to Kagari, boom! They are now playing Sky Strikers and they're playing Sky Strikers without any Sky Striker cards. <laughs> so you tell me how that goes. Uh, then there's Rivalry. So Rivalry, depending on what they're running in terms of their engine, you can hit them when they have the Sky Striker token. If they have the Sky Striker token, the best part is now they have, can only play with Warrior Monsters. But they do have Warriors. Neo Space Connector is a Warrior. The Phantom Knight stuff, they are Warriors. Uh, they have options. Uh, just, just pointing that out there. And the token is Dark. So if they manage to get a bunch of dark stuff, they can go into Bardish. And Bardish, if they somehow can actually get into the summon of an Xyz monster, yeah, it'll spell trouble for you. But if they go into Trickstar monsters, they'll now lock into fairies. And I don't think they have very many of those. And once they're stuck with the fairies, I guess they're playing uh, Trickstars without Trickstar cards. Phantom Knight monsters, you can lock them into like just dark Phantom Knight monster, which are warriors. That will lock them out of playing machines. But the thing is that you don't want them to play is machines. Because once they get into machines, they can machine into machines. And then they can go into uh, Dingirzu. Dingirzu is going to send rivalry to the graveyard. So, and that's a bit of a waste. Other things that they can use, they have spell trap removal. And they have danger Bigfoot. Yeah, that's it. If they have Bigfoot, they have Bigfoot. That's only if they run Bigfoot. I don't think uh, they run Bigfoot. Then there's Gozen Match. Goes and match. You can lock them into Sky Striker Kagari. That's nice. You don't want them to play into Darks because if they play into Darks, you are a little boned. You can also hit them on their Trick Star monster. You can also use it against them when they uh, use Neo Space Connector and just completely lock them out into Light monsters. And with Light monsters, they go into nothing. But if they go into Kagari, uh, keep in mind that if they yeah, if they're stuck with Kagari. They can summon out an Ash Blossom Joy Spring and then make a Phoenix and pop it. Uh, and then by that time, they'll have a Nightmare. So they're just going to continue to combo from there. Just just keep that in mind because that's why Gozen, kind of an interesting timing. But these are the timings for Floodgates. I know there are other Floodgates like uh, Imperial Iron Wall, but I'll talk about that within the tech section. And hey, woof! Time for text, and I'm back. Seems like I have space over here to kind of shove my mug here, but I'm still gonna look at the screen over here to kind of read this stuff out. Okay, first off, we have removal control, and then we have going first, going second. I know this overlaps with the previous stuff, but I'm gonna talk about some of the intricacies and timing. So first of all, Twin Twisters. You should target the field spell and a fog blade that you know of, because you have to set one. So um, just ask them what did they set. I guess they don't really have to answer you, but you should remember where it is anyway. So looking at Twin Twisters, yeah, hit those. Why? Because yeah, your opponent is immediately going to chain the Simple Skeleton in the Graveyard, reviving the Dingirisu. But if you've used this, at least you won't have to lose two monsters right away. And the last thing you have to answer to is the remaining Fog Blade that you know of. And then you can just play from there, which makes the board a lot easier. You can break it and kill them. If you're playing Dangerous Thunders, this is what you're looking for. Then there is Mystical Space Typhoon, Cosmic Cyclone, and Typhoon. For MST Cosmic Cyclone, 
hit the field spell first. It should always be the first thing you hit. Uh, just because if they have two fog blades, then one MST isn't going to cut it. You should just hit the thing that can maximize the benefits. If you got a Typhoon, on the other hand, uh, Typhoon, you can try end phase pop the field spell. That way you don't have to deal with a simple skeleton reviving a Dinkirsu and getting that uh, Bardiche pop. Pankratops is a more fun one. You can be a bit more versatile with this one because you can bait out fog blades to prevent an attack because it's just so big. And if they summon their Dingirzu, then you can just chain on the effect of the Dingirzu because you're a, you're a quick effect, so you're going to be chaining two or above. Pop the Dingirzu because it can't protect without the ability to detach, and therefore they won't be able to get the uh, symbol skeleton back. Yeah, there's that. And then of course the auto win button for you there's evenly match if you get evenly match you just wipe them they should win unless they have crescendo if they have crescendo then it doesn't work unfortunately but if you can evenly them oh there's nothing left to deal with it's just easy mode at that point forward and they a lot of the stuff that they committed they don't get to reuse because they're banished face down then there's super poly i don't think super poly is very good i get that it bypasses crescendo but that's it you have a big bead stick that eats up your extra monster zone and uh, nothing more to account for it. And they can still go into Boral Sword and kill it. Yeah, there's that. Okay. Now in terms of control, I think Call by the Grave and DD Crow is probably one of the best, especially if you can hit the symbol skeleton with it. Um, or whatever the symbol skeleton targets. If you can like call by the grave symbol skeleton, you should win the game because you have two turns without like a symbol skeleton. It's like really just fog blades at that point. And there's no protection whatsoever. So yeah, there's that. Uh, then there's Chaos Hunter. If you want to play something outside of Artifact Lancia, then this is probably the way to go because Chaos Hunter gives you a 2500 body. In terms of timing, you have to wait till the Bardiche summon happens. Remember, a lot of people, when they go into Galatea, they don't immediately use the effect because they don't want to get Ghost Ogre. And because they don't want to get Ghost Ogre, they don't have the field spell. Therefore, they can't just preemptively activate Symbol Skeleton. So when they go into Bardiche, you drop Chaos Hunter. Uh, if you drop Chaos Hunter, you lock them out from getting the Galatea back. And now that they, they can't get the Galatea back, they don't get the Dingirzu. Dingirzu doesn't let them get back the Symbol Skeleton. So Symbol Skeleton is a bit stuck. I get that they probably will have one Fog Blade, but one Fog Blade, that's it. And it's a used Fog Blade too. If they if they turn off your Chaos Hunter, then that's all they really have because they have to use another material to go into a Link 3 now, or maybe a Link 4, or not Link 4, Rank 4 or Rank 3 to pop it. So yeah, there's that, but it's going to be a lot harder, that's, that's for sure. You can also try stuff like Macrocosmos, Imperial Iron Wall, Imperial Iron Wall, yeah, that's it's kind of like the same as uh, Chaos Hunter. Just wait for the right timing to use it. Uh, Majesty's Fiend is a bit of a one-sided slaughter if you think about it, because everything needs to activate with a monster effect, and they're 100% gonna fog blade this. And Waking the Dragon is a fun bait side. You can pretend to be bad. You can set the card, and then you let them pop it. They go into Dingirzu, they pop it, you summon an ultimate falcon, and now you have the biggest wall available. And they need to go into uh, the Boral Sword to kill it, otherwise they're not going to kill it. And now you can start slowly whittling away at their board. It, I, I've seen that this happen, but unfortunately if they go into Boral Sword, you're going to lose. That's all. Like, the way that you can use it properly is that they go into a Bardiche. Because Bardiche cannot be used as a link material, now they need four monsters to get there. So you just don't let them get to those four monsters and uh, just win from there. Okay, now we talk about going first, going second. If you go first, Abyss Dweller them. Just make an Abyss Dweller or you can use Vanity's Fiend. But be careful when you use Vanity's Fiend because I get that they only have one normal summon. But that one normal summon is enough if they have a trickstar card if they use trickstar they can get coral bane coral bane can run you over and yeah it's just gonna double the attack of candina a bit bit rusty there uh next we have majesty's fiends and inspector border those those are quite crippling if you time it right and if they have no outs towards it yeah you you just free turn you might need to go through a couple turns before you can kill them but it is a possibility of course, hiding all your floodgates, Call by the Grave is nice, so you don't get hand trapped yourself. Or you can set Call by the Grave to interrupt them. Either way, it's good for you, good for them. 
Uh, Artifact Lancia. I know going first, Artifact Lancia seems like an, kind of an awkward side, but it's a turn skip. So if you pass turn, you can Lancia them and then they'll have to pass turn back as long as they don't have Call by the Grave. So if you have multiple things, then this is perfect. Iron Wall Protection and Waking the Dragon going first. You can just set it just so you can bait it. Uh, it's fun. You can even do a turn going second. Uh, then we have going second, we have DD Crow Call by the Grave. Twin Twisters evenly match. If you can kill the field spell, then you can play Denko Seka. If you can't kill the field spell, don't play Denko Seka. It's just going to get killed by Dengirsu, and you just lost the normal summon for it. Artifact Lancia to turn skip, hand traps, and of course, you can pretend to be bad and play Waking the Dragons, as mentioned before. That's my rundown of how to crush Orcus. These are the interactions that we should care about, and yeah, that's it. How they follow up is that the turns are just constantly cyclical. They just reuse the same stuff over and over and over again. Yeah, I don't know much, much more I have to say, but please leave a comment down in the comments section below about what you or what your ideas are for beating Orcus so I can be enlightened by you guys. I love you guys for doing so. That's all I got for this video. If you guys enjoyed this video, smash that thumbs up button. Don't forget to hit the subscribe and ding the bell for upcoming videos. This one took a lot of research. I, if you guys follow me on my Facebook, don't forget to, I have an Instagram and a Twitter. Please follow those. I beg you, please just go to the, go to the MST site. Just hit thing you'll see all of it on the banner and then you can just follow me there i would appreciate all of you guys and just stay up to date with like the latest stuff i know you guys want the field center i'm just gonna set up an ebay page for it and then i have to deal with the shipping like every i'll probably ship out like on a saturday or something but when that happens anyways that's all i got for this one so i guess i'll see you guys in the next one Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you like this video, please drop us a like so we know we are doing a good job. And you can also subscribe to MSD.TV for more fantastic videos by clicking on the button on the left. Don't forget to check out our partners at Imperium Duelist. They make really high quality mats, including some of my own limited edition release stuff. And if you want to check out one of our past videos, click here on the right. As always, don't forget to hold on to your MST.TV and I'll see you next time.